wanted to do was kind of take you through the Stormovic and uh, why I got the ideas for it and some of the techniques that I used. And most of the techniques, in fact, actually came from the experience that I did building an armor kit. Your know, armor kits, plural. Um, so when I decided to do a Star Trek, I wanted to, to pick something that was going to be somewhat unique. And I've always been fascinated by uh, air forces with pilots from other countries operating in those air forces. And so when I spotted this on the, uh, the internet, I, I had heard that the Poles had flown uh, Stormovic in World War II as they had been in tank corps and infantry, etc. Uh, I chose that, that as, a, as a subject. So there's a very good website called uh, SovietWarplanes.com. They have a whole array of, of uh, uh, profiles, and this being one of them. And the, the nice thing about their site is, is they actually show you the, the sort of reference photo that they're trying to base the profile on. So you'll notice a couple of things. If you, if you kind of compare the profile with the actual picture, you'll see how light this is, because it's obviously a light color. And this is very light as well. Same, it's the same color. These three are all the same color, yet if you look at this actual picture, you see it's hard to discern the, those colors. So it kind of suggests that they get dirty, and it kind of obviously would get dirty in those areas, because obviously that's where the engine is. And that's where they get in and out of the car. Um, so one of the one of the drawbacks of doing uh, Soviet subjects is that it's not as rich as uh, British or American subjects in terms of actual photographs, nice clear photographs of the subjects at hand. And so if you're interested in doing aircraft weathering, I would suggest that you're going to have to actually probably broaden your horizon in terms of what you're going to look at to get some ideas of actually how to weather things. Better. You. Yeah, thank you. So this is a mosquito, and if you notice how black it is under the engines, and how it's actually bled onto the tailplanes. And so the point is, is that these engines are naturally very dirty. In fact, if you're as old as me, you remember cars used to leak oil profusely. That's more or less kind of way. So that kind of gives you an idea, or right? it gives me an idea that the engines in those days were much more prone to leaks than, than what we would expect today. And if you think that, you know, some people might say, well, yeah, but sure, that's a war plane and it was war, you know, they don't really get that dirty that fast. This is a warbird, and so it's worth, I don't know, $10, 15000000 million. And if you zoom in, see the filth and the dirt and all that kind of stuff. So I wanted a way to represent these kinds of features on, on a model. And so it took me a couple of years to kind of get the hang of, of how to accomplish, the, accomplish this. And one of the things that's really benefited me is actually working on armor kits. Because they're a lot more um, uh, focused on weathering. There's a lot more documentation, a lot more books, etc., a lot more tutorials available online around how to actually weather armor. And if I actually take you back to this picture, you can you can kind of see, or maybe not so much really in the back, but it's it's a very mottled appearance on the bottom of this airplane. You can even see there's a repair patch here, a very distinct repair patch. And the, the, the undersurface is very irregular and uneven. It's very dirty. So I wanted to I wanted to accomplish this kind of look and and uh, feel to the models that I was building. So the first thing that you have to do is, uh, the first thing I do, whatever model I'm building, is I always, always, always prime the model. And I do that because I, I generally use multimedia. So I generally use photo etch, I often use resin, and when you combine that with the plastic parts, you want a uniform surface that the paint's going to group to. The other thing is, is that the techniques that I'm going to describe, some of the techniques involving oil paints and enamels, they can be abusive on the, the actual finish itself. So you want to do your best to give yourself a very stable and, and secure finish with which you can work with those kinds of chemicals. So I use Mr. Surface <coughs> and I thin it down uh, very aggressively because I don't want to obliterate any of the detail that's on the kit. And so what that means is, is when you're actually airbrushing, you've got to be very careful because if you're using lacquer thinner, if it pools in any spot, it's going to probably wreck your finish. It's probably going to wreck the model. It's probably going to melt it. 
one of the things, thinking about that, John, I used to use a product called Illumilite to do my casting, and I got one batch, and I, I'd always prime with lacquer primer, and it shrank the stuff, and it made it go sticky, and it, the resin just did not like the, the, and it was, I don't use it anymore, but when I was using it, I hadn't got problems for ages, and one day I got this part all sticky and coming in. Probably the resin. Yeah, because the resin was still like the lacquer. Have you, sir, have you ever tried thin, instead of using the spray booth? So if you're going to be working with these kinds of products, um, so I use Tamiya paint exclusively for airbrushing, and even though it's advertised as a lacquer, or pardon me, as an acrylic, it's actually a lacquer. So you want to do your best to avoid breathing in these fumes. So I, my father actually built me this many years ago. It's really simple, but it's very effective. And it just makes sure, it just saves my lungs, basically. Uh, when I'm doing the uh, lacquer thinning, yes, but if I'm doing the rest, I don't bother. That's what I use with the, when I'm using when I'm doing Mr. Surfacer and the lacquer thinner, I use it then. But otherwise, I don't bother. No. Problems? No. Um, <laughs> no. Um, no. <laughs> so this is an example of multimedia. So this has got photo etch, um, brass, uh, wire. Um, and these are resin. So after getting it all painted up, that's, that's a good, does that? That's a good, does it, yeah. So anyway, so that's that's after it's all been primed and obviously painted and, and the detail picked out and all that kind of stuff. Um, so um, I added extra detail. So I actually riveted the the, the wings using the, the riveting tool there. And so that's another reason why you have to be careful when you're going to prime, because if you're not careful, the primer's too thick, you're going to obliterate all that work that you've done. Um, so the other thing I like to do is I like to make sure that I'm calling attention to things that I've added to the model, and I'm also trying to obviously capture the essence of the, the airplane in the way that it actually got used and, and worked on. So one of the common things that occurs on airplanes is that when the crew both the air crew and the ground crew get on it, of course they're going to wear down the paint, they're going to chip the paint off the wings. So there's a variety of techniques out there for doing this effect. The simplest way is just to paint the model and then use a, a silver uh, pestle around and actually go away and, and chip at it. I found that is okay, but it's not effective for making big chips. I tried a technique a number of years ago using salt, where you take salt, you wet the surface and you, you just sprinkle salt on it. The problem I found with that was is that in some cases the salt was actually starting to melt, and so what would happen is it would run into the the, the, um, um, the panel lines and the other detail. So it was, it was it was concerning that I was not going to be able to get it off cleanly. And then I read a um, article, um, Armor Site article, and <coughs> what what the guy did was he took the uh, Vallejo liquid masks. So there's a bunch of different products out there that that, that uh, are liquid masks. And this particular one is actually water soluble. So I figured that because I, I pre-painted this silver, I used um, I used Mr. Color Silver. And so because that was pre-painted, it was a very smooth surface. And so the combination of the water thinning the liquid mass meant that when I dabbed it on with a, with a as you can see, but I mean you can't, that's a sponge. When I dabbed it on with a sponge, it actually beaded. So it, it aided in, the, in creating a random chip effect. And the thing I like about this is, is that the, the, the little bits of uh, the little the little bits of um, mass um, they, they're, they don't come off cleanly. They will not sink into the surface and otherwise damage the, the effect that I'm after. And the other thing that I liked was. Um, so if you ever look at, at the way chipping works, of course it doesn't all happen at once. So you're going to have some chips that are fresher than others. So therefore some chips are going to be shinier than others. So I was able to leave some of the, the bits of fluid right to the very end. So I got very some shiny spots and some really dull spots. Because those dull spots obviously got weathered with the rest of the model. John, how did you, uh, how did you remove the mask? It was just with a toothpick. It's just okay, so like these big the, enough dots. Oh, yeah. yep. yeah, yeah. Sometimes you can even rub it off with your finger. Your finger. Right. Yep. Okay. So a very, very useful tool for me is a, you know, the flat toothpicks. 
So I, I just bevel the edge of it so it's nice and sharp. And, and it's amazing. It's a great, great tool because it'll never damage the plastic, right? It's, 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 it just won't do it because it's wood. Um, so the next thing I did after um, this effect here was lay down the primary colors. And they're always the hardest colors to paint because they're, uh, the red is a very hard color to paint. But I found that it actually went quicker by spraying it first with like a dark rust color and then spraying the red over top of that. And that gave me a nice um, faded red color and it made it easier to actually apply the red. You can notice that, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this, you notice how, how tight the spray pattern is even though it's, a, it's sort of a general uh, application of paint. John, do you do the, the darker colors first or the lighter colors? Oh, to me, that's actually detailed painting. So the big, big thing that I learned many years ago was when I first got an airbrush, it was like you'd hold your model and you know I was like everybody else, you'd, you'd hold your airbrush, you'd press the trigger down over here and you'd spray across like that, release the trigger and then back and so on. That's the way I learned how to do airbrushing way back in the days when Derek was at York Mills and, and I was a little lot younger than I am now. And so I graduated from that to actually painting the model from the beginning in, in, as if I was painting it in a detailed way. So I switched from a, from a medium tip to a fine tip and actually apply a very tight pattern even when I'm laying down basic colors. And I'm doing that because I want that model effect, that, that weathered effect on the actual paint itself. And the other thing is, is I, I, I fit it very heavily, so it's mostly thinner than I'm actually using. So it takes a long time for the paint to actually build up. But the advantage of doing it this way is you get a much deeper set of, a much deeper looking color, and there's no chance of you obliterating the detail. And if you are going to use Tamiya, I found that it works much, much better when you actually mix gloss with their flat paint. And the reason for that is that I can actually see the, I can walk the paint across the surface. Whereas when it's flat, it dries so quickly, it's sometimes hard to see when it's actually being, when it's actually hitting the surface. So when it's wet, or when it's glossy, I should say, it's easier for me to actually walk the paint across the surface. So this is me starting the, uh, the underside color. So to your question, I mean, do I use a lighter or a dark color? I actually used a dark color here because what I was trying to do was pre-stain the paint. So you'll see that I've concentrated the, the dark color in, in sort of obvious places. So where the control surfaces are, where the flaps are, where the guns are in the wing, where the exhaust from the rockets, around where the bombs would, would win the inside base, and especially around the rad and the engine itself. Notice I didn't bother doing it on the rad here, because it's rare that the oil actually drips outside, like it usually comes behind from the, from the plumbing that connects the rad to the engine. So I'm using a very dark color. This is field blue, so it's almost, it's a, you can see it's a pretty dark color. And then I start, I start softening it out. So you can see that, well, that watching this is, is getting taken down. And then I finally get to here. So I would consider that ready now for the weather. So you see I've, I've established where the control surfaces are and where the oil is not actually going to be leaking out of the engine. So it's starting to suggest, it's helping me, it's almost guiding me where the, where the weathering is going to be when the model's actually being weathered and painted. Question, do you go like for that first color, are you going panel by panel or just the general? Great question, yeah, because that's a great question. So I used to, I used to do the, uh, the panel thing and I think it's much more effective when it's brand. The only thing I definitely want to pick out are the, where the control surfaces are and maybe establishing where some of the heavy weathering is going to be. <coughs> but otherwise, I, I believe it should be random. Because otherwise, I, I think, it's obviously personal opinion, but I think it looks too much like a quilt. So I did the same thing on the top. And you'll notice that I'm using paper <coughs> to establish where the cowl is. And I use paper because it, it, I use uh, 
uh, tomato tape rolled into itself. So I end up with a long line of tomato tape. Just cut it up into sections, put it on the paper, and then so the paper actually stands proud of the surface. So that means when I, when I airbrush along the edge of the paper, it'll be a soft edge underneath. And so I do this for a couple of reasons. I, I primarily do it because if I did this all freehand, I would not be able to get the same effects with all the staining because I'd be so busy trying to make sure that the, the, the pattern is tight, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have enough leeway to be able to play around and shift the color and so on as I like to do, as you saw when I was doing the bottom. And you'll see too that I'm, all I'm doing is I found it really easy just to take a, a, like a same scale profile of, of the airplane that you're working on and just use I and mean, draw the pattern on the paper and bob your own. Okay, so when I got it done, I looked at this and I thought, you know what, this looks way too Vietnam for me. Yeah. <laughs> and so why it looks that way is because the paint, the colors have shifted a lot as, as I've been airbrushing them. The other thing is, it's like any Air Force, the Russian colors are unique. And once again, there's not as much documentation on Russian colors as there is, as, say, Luftwaffe or RAF or whatever. So I, I had a, a good idea of what the color needed to be, but by the time that I went around, did all my mixing, all my shading, it's going to be a little bit harder to see it here, but there's all kinds of subtlety built into the, the paint job. What ends up happening is, is you're going to gray out your color, because one of the things you're going to do is you're going to use white to, to lighten up your shades. So, and this color here has got a lot of red to it, so that's, that's warming up the airplane. It's making it seem tropical. So the solution is something called a filter. And this is something that I kind of wrestled with for a long time. I read about what they were, I heard a lot of people talk about them, but I wasn't quite sure what the application was. And it's actually, this is the first model that I really used it, I think it worked effectively for me. Now unfortunately, I didn't capture it, so I'm gonna actually have to use some pictures of the Tiger tank that I made. So I actually used an armor technique on an on a aircraft before I used the same technique on an actual tank. So in the case of the Tiger Tank, when I painted the Tiger Tank, by the time I was done, I once again grayed out the color too much, and German tanks had a very distinctive yellow tinge to the cowl. So in this example, I used a, 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 a yellow filter. So what that did was is it, 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 it re-warmed uh, up the color. So when I did the Stormovic, I used a blue. So I brushed the blue filter <coughs> on the model, and that cooled it down and made it seem less tropical. So is this filter like a wash? Yes, it's thinner than a wash. And you gotta be careful, it's a great question. You gotta be careful when you apply it, especially on something like uh, the Stormovic, because it has rivets, you don't wanna slosh it on. You don't want it to turn into a wash. You wanna shift the color. You don't wanna, with a wash, you're trying, to, you're trying to accentuate a detail, you're trying to add depth. With a filter, you're trying to shift the color. Having said that, I did find it a very effective way to accentuate the rivets, because it was so thin it just picked them up just enough that it, it suggested them without making it so obvious that you could see. In this picture, you can't tell that this is riveted. If you look, if you look at the real one, you'll see the rivets are there. And that's, that's what I wanted. The filter helped me do that. Hey, is this filter, like, is it acrylic based, enamel based? It's enamel. So, uh, great question. So, uh, once I get done painting, like, all the airbrush work, it's always enamels or oils that I'm using. And that's because of the working time and the fact that you can easily, easily manipulate it with thinner. So what I actually, it's a great question in mind. So one of the other things that I, I do is that once the painting, once I'm satisfied with the airbrush work, I seal it. And I used to use gloss, but I've actually shifted to semi-gloss because I do want a little bit of grip on the surface to, to help stay, like to help the paint. Because if, you, if it's just pure gloss, and you start putting a wash on it, it will go into all the details, but it won't go anywhere else. It will not grip the surface. And so for one of the other techniques that I like to use, so once again, um, this is a technique I used on that before I used it on a tank. It's kind of interesting because it's actually an armor technique. So it's, it's commonly called the oil paint dot um, uh, technique. And it's where you're taking a, sh a shade of the color that you're working with, and you're manipulating that paint and giving it that much more depth. So, so you, I, it's kind of hard to notice because of the, the, the projector, but I'm, I'm putting green where the green is, 
by putting, you know, like warm yellow red colors where the yellow is. And so on the start of it, I, I lined up the oil colors to look like those and, and added depth <coughs> for the depths that are So this is a technique that's not for the faint of heart. So it's called speckling. And um, so what it involves doing is, um, the best analogy I can think of is I used to have a black car. And whenever it came out of the, into the car after it had rained, you would see all the dots of the, of the rain, right? The dust, you know, the liquefy and all that, you, you, the car would be covered in it. And so you kind of think about it, that's, that's how most things get dirty, they get rained on, and they, they, they mark up the paint. And so what, spec, what speckling does is, I took, um, this was, in this case it was humble paint, thinned it down very, very thin, you can see how watery it is. I took an old brush, dipped it in that paint, and then flicked it all over the model. So it's going to scare you because it's going to look like, whoa, like where, how am I going to say that like, this, is, this is a disaster? But again, one of the advantages of, of this type of paint is, is that you can take off those spots that just don't look right. So if you look closely at both those models, you'll see very tiny specks of paint that either reflect rain or rust. Now, there's, no, nothing, uh, there's no rust on the story, but there's definitely rust specks on the tiger tank. So once again, th these techniques are all, are all part of trying to give that model this patina that is closer to reality than I think is otherwise possible. And if you think about what's going on, I'm, I'm trying to replicate what's going on as part of, of a natural occurrence with any kind of physical object, particularly a machine. <coughs> Um, so, uh, one of the things I've struggled with, uh, I've never been able to get the hang of, is, is trying to paint with an airbrush an exhaust stain. And particularly with the Stormovic, it's got a it's got an arc to it because of the because of the way the airflow obviously goes on the side of the fuselage. So, what worked really well for me is a product um, called Pigments. So, what I did was is I, I I kind of mapped out where the where the stain would go and kind of try to establish where the arc was. And then I simply took a Q-tip, dipped it in thinner, dried it off pretty aggressively so it was just moist, and then just arc the, uh, the stain. That gave me the effect that I was looking for. And it's way easier than doing it by airbrush, because of course if you mess it up, you're, it's a tough spot to get yourself out of. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to repaint that area. <coughs> And if you've done all the weathering that, that I've just done, if it's a big, big job. Yes. Sir. What kind of stain did you use for the Was it, was it uh, also enamel? Yes. Yes. Um, so this is the finished airplane. This is the finished uh, stain. So once again, it's probably hard to see. I got some detail shots, but, you, but I've established all the oil streaks coming out from the rad, coming away from the engine. Um, it's also hard to see, but I, I did another technique where um, uh, there's some very interesting pictures, maybe you've seen them, of uh, Corsairs, especially in the Pacific. And they are just splattered on the bottom because they would land on these, these uh, tropical airfields that would be subject to rainstorms. And they would just be splattered with, with uh, mud. And it's something I don't think, I, I mean, I, I, with all due modesty, I've never really seen an airplane try to replicate that, that effect. So what I did was I, I, um, I took a paintbrush, loaded it up with a combination of pigment and humble paint, and thinned it out again. And I held it roughly where the wheel would be, and then I, I blew the airbrush through the paint. And once again, because it's, because it's an oil-based, enamel-based product, anything that looked bad or wrong or out of place, it's just, it's calm. You might be able to see it a bit better in this shot. And I, I did the same thing with, with, a, with a darker color. So it's, I, I think it's got a nice kind of effect where it's, it's suggesting that these planes, obviously they operated from, they didn't operate from, from the island airport. I mean, they, they operated from, uh, from pretty rustic fields. 
the streaks behind the exhaust you did with the brush or when you uh, yeah, it? No, no, this is this here is all brush work. And so the thing about this, uh, great question. The thing about that is it took me it took me a while to, to realize that the line should not be perfectly straight. So if you look at a lot of streaking oil streaks on airplanes, they're perfectly straight back and they're they're like in a V pattern. And if you if you look at if you look at any liquid and you and you kind of study how it goes, it, it kind of meanders, even when it's being worn across the surface at high speed. And it's meandering, of course, because the, the surface is not even. The surface has got all kind of curve to it, and the surface itself is rough. So um, this is something that I, I, I know no other way to do it except with oil paint. And the reason I would use oil paint is because it's the concentration of the pigment is so great that the tiniest little dab of, of, of um, oil paint with the combination of thinner, and that the you've got days of working time, literally days of working time, to manipulate it to, to follow that kind of natural meandering. So the point that if you're ever driving along the highway, it takes a while to kind of get your head around that and, and understand how you're going to do that with a, with a paintbrush. So it's taken me a couple of years to get to a point where I can do that sort of thing. At least. And somebody was asking me earlier about the red fins. Well, I was, as I was building this model, I was walking with Dr. Shivago, and the, the commies used to love red, so I just figured, you know what, that's a good way to kind of create a little bit of interest on the model and get people asking questions about it. So that's why I did it. I thought it was a tracer rod. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can also, it's, again, it's, it's a projector. So this is a lot of mud and grime. The wheels, obviously. So this is uh, this is once again is, is all those those weathering products that are now available. Mostly they're, they're positioned for armor guys, but really I mean brown is brown, right? So that's the last slide. If anybody has any more questions. So John, it, well as a, as an aside to that, that means that if we're going to go into weathering, you do still need to get some. Like some weathering, like pigments. Is that correct? Uh, well, if you want to do it this way, yes. So, John, when did you put the decals? Uh, they're not decals. They're uh, they're painted. Wow. Oh, sorry. They're painted. Oh, uh, sorry. Sorry. When it starts? Yeah. Uh, sorry. The the uh, the Polish. Uh, Alcada. Alcada is the word. Is a decal. Everything else. No, no, I'm saying, like, in what order? No. Like, Thank you very much, John. That's very enlightening. So thank you very much.